Uh, right, well, good morning and thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I took the Vince approach to this talk and decided I would give a rather general overview rather than concentrating too much on details. So I start off with a, a little bit of discussion about, about models in terms of what they may do for you and how much they cost and what you may wish to do. Uh, done like this for considering scattering problems. Now, I remember going to Phil Burke's retirement do, and our chair appeared there, wrote this equation on the board, and proceeded to talk about it at great length for about 50 minutes without any other pr props or aids or, or, or inversions. So I won't quite do that, but I'm going to do a variation on that for a, for a couple of minutes, because this is actually a rather key equation that appears, basically underpins all the major scattering models that I think fell out of the sort of formalism wars that Tom referred to of 30 years ago. Uh, so your, your close coupling equation has a sum over, do you have a pointer here, by the way? Yep, yep, yep. Has a sum over target states with a continuum function and some anti-symmetrizer, and then has some other term which somehow does all sorts of strange things to like relax the orthogonality, put in all the bits you left out of the other bits, the equations, and all sorts of other things. And, how, how you actually treat this term gets, gets quite complicated, and I will discuss some of, some of the issues that arise for that in terms of the four models that are commonly used for doing the calculations. So the sort of simplest model um, of static exchange, the great advantage of static exchange is, unlike any of the other models, it's uniquely defined, which means that I can do a calculation, and he can do a calculation, and he can do a calculation, and we should all get the same answer, otherwise there are bugs in our codes, basically, because this, this model... Should, should be the same for all methods. So static exchange is nice and simple. You have one target state, normally represented with a hartree fock configuration. You have some continuum functions. And then you have something which does no more than relax the orthogonality constraint you've made by generating your continuum functions. To, if you use, and I think everyone still in the molecular field still uses orthonormal orbital sets. I have to say, in atomic physics, there's an increasing use of non-orthogonal sets of orbitals, and presumably that changes this but that hasn't got as far as the molecules yet. My view is it takes 15 years. So you watch, you watch what the atomic people are doing today, and you know that in 2027, 2027 we will be doing the same thing. That's roughly, give Erebar about three years, but that's roughly how long it takes. <laughs> Don't bank on it. <laughs> I have to say, my, my, my popular talk features the transit of Venus, which I think was pretty good on this side of the Atlantic this year. If you missed it... The next one is 2117, so you really won't be around. Uh, anyway, that's a diversion. Uh, so what does this do for you? You get shape resonances, normally too high in energy, but you get them. Uh, no flashback resonances. Great advantage is actually you can get a very high energy. Uh, Vince showed this yesterday, going up, you know, you don't sit in pseudo-resonance and other type problems. So this works reasonably well at higher energies. And as I say, the model is well-defined and give the same answers. Now, I'm not going to show any static exchange results. I will show results from all other models that I talk about. The way you improve upon that, remaining within the same sort of philosophy, is to continue with a hartree fock wave function, but start putting in polarisation. So that gives you a static exchange plus polarisation method. The standard way of doing this is to consider single excitations out of your hartree fock wave function and putting two particles into your resulting continuum orbitals, uh, resulting L squared orbitals because you have your free electron. This captures the short range polarization effects rather efficiently, perhaps too efficiently because actually the model is not that well controlled. You can end up making your whole anion state get too low. So it's good for shape resonances. You tend to be able to maneuver them into the right place. If you work too hard, you can maneuver them through the right place and too low down. But if you're uh, either have a good eye or are slightly unscrupulous, you just stop where the experimental results is and you get excellent agreement. Uh, it, so it's good for shape resonances and can capture fleshback resonances, but of course it doesn't have the parent state. So for instance, if you're doing electron collisions with an ion, you may get the lowest one or two fleshback resonances, but you won't get the whole infinite series, series of them. Uh, if you go above the first electronic excitation threshold, this method is played with pseudo-resonances, so that gives a, an energy range for it. Uh, and it can be a bit, a bit unbalanced. Uh, resonances, you certainly can get resonances that are too low. So if you want to do better than that, you then start putting in close coupling. Uh, now if, as certainly I do, that you rely on configuration interaction targets to generate your excited states, you actually lose a lot 
in terms of being able to have the balance between the Hartree Fock. Hartree Fock has nice properties in terms of being able to put extra electrons in the system and not disturb your target. And you have a real problem here with these CI methods that then it's unclear what your target wave function is in terms of nice orbital representations so that when you put extra electrons in, you can actually break the nice problems you have. You can overcorrelate without knowing about it. But uh, if you want many states, you really can't do them reliably on a single state excitation problem. So you have to, you have to go towards some sort of CI representation. So now we've got the same equation again, but now this summation has come in here because we've got several states. The method we favour, but I wouldn't say it's necessarily exclusive, is actually to do a small sort of complete active space CI within some set of valence orbitals. That has the advantage that when you put an extra electron in there, you don't do anything to the correlation of the problem, so that keeps it the same. Uh, this, in principle, captures short-range polarization effects and state coupling, but it doesn't capture the short-range polarization effects as, you can, as well as you can do rather easily in SEP. So typically, your shape resonances, which had moved down rather nicely in your SEP model, suddenly move back up again when you do your close coupling calculations, and you have to work quite hard at them, really, to get them go, back, go down, down again. The great advantage is that you get your feshback resonances rather nicely. You have the parent states in there, providing your parent state is in the right place. You can actually get a whole series of feshback resonances really very well. This now works up. You've extended your energy range compared to SEP because you've got your excited states in. So it works up to the first missing excited state that you don't have in your expansion. And above that, you're back in pseudo resonance territory. And of course, now you can begin to study electron impact excitation. And as I said already, it's hard in this method to recover full polarization effects. So what we've been searching for is really a method which combines the virtues of this and helps us to recover the polarization effects. So there was some reference to this. So I don't think anyone's shown any results of them. The method we favored is actually putting in pseudostates, putting extra states into this model. So you have a target representation with many physical states, basically the same physical states as we had notionally on the last transparency, but then you add extra states to the problem, which are called pseudosates because they're not meant to represent anything physical in, in the actual system. Uh, so you have the same equation looking like here, but this sum has now become bigger, and you have occupied states which become pseudostates. And the idea of the pseudostates is to capture your polarization effects so they can actually represent the target polarization properly, and I'll give you an example of what I mean by that they do the state coupling and in principle they can do the ionization in fact we started off doing this for ionization and then actually there are these disgustingly good semi-empirical models for doing ionization you basically go to the NIST website and it'll give, instantly give you what your answer for your ionization cross-section is very good through the experiment but you really want to spend three months calculating it and getting it right for about a 10 eV range and you can get the whole k eV range right instantly <laughs> so in principle this works for ionization but I wouldn't really recommend anyone to try and try and spend their life calculating ionization this way uh, this again is good for giving you the resonances and saying that couple states is and can give you pseudo resonances when you go up to higher energy and I'll show you show you that in principle you can do a very extended energy range here and go above the ionization so this gives in principle a converged treatment of reps of polarization but it's computationally expensive so at the moment we've only done this for relatively few electron systems so I have a, I have we have a project actually to move a lot of our codes to parallel computing uh, and the goal I'm looking at is, say, doing uracil or guanine with this sort of model. At the moment, that is not computationally feasible for us to do. So this is, I would say, similar in spirit for something like convergence close coupling, which has proved incredibly powerful for few electron atomic systems, but it works for many, for many electron systems. So that's the idea. So having sort of introduced a series of hierarchy of models, I'll say a few words about the R matrices series and then I'm going to go through giving you sort of sort of calculations that we've been doing recently just showing a sample of each sort of calculation that, as the model. So the R matrix method is the most conceptually simple involves dividing the world into two regions an inner region where you can find your target wave function and an outer region where you do your scattering in some sort of long range potential. Uh, I will say some of its virtues but really if you want to read carefully about it I wrote a big review about it two years ago, and that's still pretty much up to date, so you can go and look at that. So in the inner region, you have exchange and correlation effects being rather important, so you need to 
consider those carefully, and that's something, of course, the quantum chemists, as we just heard in the last talk, have done a lot of work on. So we can actually capture a lot of that from quantum chemistry codes. So here we adapt a quantum chemistry code, but then you have to worry about a few things which are a bit different from quantum chemistry. You want high L functions because you're scattering. That's not normally a feature of quantum chemistry codes. Even very sophisticated quantum chemistry codes seem to stumble at K integrals these days. Uh, we want an integration over a finite volume because we put these things in an R matrix. You actually do that by integrating over to infinity and then chopping the tails off rather than integrating over a finite volume. You need to include continuum functions. We use Gaussians at the moment, at least for the polyatomic molecules. That's a subject of current research. Like in all scattering methods, you need to worry a lot about orthogonality. So you need special methods, more rigorous methods than the band state people do for enforcing orthogonality. And the thing I did actually while I was here 15 years ago was to write a completely specific way of building the Hamiltonian for the programs so we can generate configurations and build a Hamiltonian actually designed for a scattering calculation opposed to piggybacking on the back of a quantum chemistry code configuration generator. Uh, and if you do that, you can make huge computational savings. The boundary is divided, defined by the point where the target wave function has zero amplitude. And this is the R matrix method because what you do on the boundary is build an R matrix. The R matrix is the thing which takes you from here to here. We actually use the R matrix in the long range region to propagate, but that is not particularly unique to our method. A lot of other people propagate R matrices, but the, the, why this is the R matrix method is you use it to communicate between the two regions. In the outer region, it's funny, I've had this statement that we adopt atomic electron atom codes on my transparencies for probably 15 years. We're actually doing it at the moment. I don't think we ever had done. We had our own outer region codes, which are not the atomic ones. But the atomic people, particularly looking for mightily charged ions, where they have things like iron, iron ions have huge numbers of channels and lots of resonances, needed really efficient codes. And we've actually just, in the last year or so, started using PFARM and things like that adopted for, for the atomic codes. You need long-range multiple potentials. Uh, I put polarization in there. You get the dipole potentials that give you the polarization. Many degenerate channels, which you don't normally have in the atomic codes, and then these dipole couplings. So this is the equation back again. I don't think I'll dwell on it again. You'll see it at least once more in this in this thing. So we build our, in the polyatomic version of this code, we build everything from Gaussians. So we have Gaussians built on the target wave functions and Gaussians for our continuum functions as well. That has a great advantage of making the integrals rather simple. It has disadvantages if you're trying to get out to a long distance here with a set of Gaussians set here. That, that tends to put a constraint on our, on our R matrix radius. I don't think we'll worry too much about that. So start off with first example, and I don't know why, but spacecraft re-entry physics seem to suddenly become popular in Europe. So if you're looking, if you're, if you're looking for, for money to do some electron molecule scattering at the moment, it seems to be that spacecraft re-entry seems to be a way of getting some money to do this. So I'm part of this particular project, which is Fizz for Entry, run by uh, Mario Capitelli and Barry, and they're particularly interested. They haven't actually told us they're interested in spacecraft re-entry in Venus and Mars, but they want us to work on our CO and CO2. So my conclusion is that this is not Earth re-entry that they're worrying, they're worrying about. Uh, so we've done a series of calculations on CO, where this is an SEP calculation of the CO uh, doublet pi, CO minus doublet pi resonance, being careful to try and get this crossing point correct. Actually, this bit of the calculation is done with Molpro. This bit of the calculation is done with our electron scattering code. And because what they're interested in is every vibrational state in the system, what we've actually done here is adopt a highly accurate potential energy curve, and we simply adjust our resonance curves to follow the curve in, in the correct way. The width, as it should do, goes to zero at the crossing point here. And then what you try and do is you try and check that against the available experimental data. So the experimental data by Michael Allen in particular looking at this, and we, this is a well-known, very complicated problem, uh, going from naught up to high V. Our results are reasonably good at the low Vs, so not quite as good at the highest Vs when you go up to, I think, V equals 10 is the biggest he's done, but the cross-sections get very, very small, so we're really interested in the, in the large, large cross-section large cross section processes. So if you, have a, if you have a model which you think is, looks roughly right, you can then go and run that model for things that experimentalists really can't hope to do, which is looking at all these very high excited states and actually try and work out 
what the effects are. And you, the effects are here is you get the excitations going right the way down to threshold if you're not careful, or very near threshold, because the effective way the resonance behaves at the, at the high V states. So this is the data that people actually want for their database so they can do these sort of re-entry type models. We're talking about plasmas at 10,000 Kelvin and this sort of thing, with the, essentially every, every state of the carbon monoxide occupied and a lot of these interactions going on. We've also played around with the effect of putting rotations in. Now, this is rather crude. All we do is add a JJ plus one term to your one-dimensional Hamiltonian, and look how that shifts the wave functions around, but it gives you some modeling for how the rotational behavior of this might go on. Now, uh, my postdoc is meant to be working on CO2. I'm rather glad he didn't sit through Tom's talk yesterday, because he's already shown big resistance to going over from two atoms to three atoms. So <coughs> What he's actually been is rather inventive at finding rather, other, rather, rather, rather good other diatomic molecules to work on because he understands those. Uh, but I think at some point our paymasters are going to say to us, we really do have to work on this because, because that's actually what the EU gave us money for. But that's, for instance, an example that he's been looking at dissociative attachment, attachment in oxygen uh, using a rather similar method, looking, following the resonances and then looking at the vibrational dependence of this process. So carrying on a, on a similar theme, so this, my student Duncan Little is also paid for to do spacecraft re-entry, though actually by a different source within the UK, and they are definitely are interested in the Earth's atmosphere, and they have a code for modelling spacecraft re-entry, which at the, <coughs> at the moment has absolutely no ionic processes in at all. So we said to them, what ionic processes do they want? And they looked and sort of shrugged their shoulders. So we started to look at ionic nitrogen, because it seemed to be that there's a lot of nitrogen up there, so it's a good good system to look at. Uh, Steve Guberman in the audience has had a similar thought because he's just issued a very extensive paper with some of the curves he will recognize that I'm about to show you in, in his paper. Uh, it's also a good problem to look at because actually it's rather hard to measure experimentally because if you look at how the storage rings work, they put a molecule in, they whiz it round until it's cool, and if you have something like N2, it just doesn't cool because there's no dipoles in there, so it's very difficult to get a good cold sample something like N2. So I'll contrast this with NO+, plus, which is a big, also a big iron at the top of the atmosphere. There's been a lot of work on NO+. Plus. So both the dissociative recombination of NO+, plus is very well measured and actually quite well modelled theoretically. And the Rydberg states of NO+, plus are also very well characterised. I was stunned by how little is known about the Rydberg states of N2. So uh, we've, we've been doing this using the close coupling model. The last one was doing an SCP model. Uh, the thing which really encouraged me that's got me to get Duncan to look at this in detail was the first thing he did was go away and try and model the three low states of N2+. Plus. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> <coughs> the X, A and B states and his relatively simple calculation for these done with a quadruple zeta basis set and a simple CAS model actually gives extremely good representations of them which makes you hope you can get the curves in the right place. So the advantage nowadays of modern computers is as well as we used to map these things out at sort of 20 points for the whole grid point, he discovered that he could do these points at about 10 minutes a point. So he simply put in and asked for 200 of them overnight. And what we're beginning to do now is to get actually all these avoided crossings really characterized at considerable detail, which is something historically we were not able to do so that you're beginning to actually get really complete maps of all the processes that go on in this region, which... This is, no, no, this is using our code. So we have checked them with MOLPRO. In fact, I have a following... I don't think I have any MOLPRO results, but I have a following comparison. The thing about MOLPRO is it doesn't have our basis functions in. I guess if you put our basis functions into MOLPRO, it might, it might give similar results. Down at this end, we, can, we have done extensively checks with MOLPRO, and we are using orbitals from MOLPRO to seed the process in the, fir in the, in the first place. Which symmetry is this? So this particular symmetry, does it not say on it? Oh, it's, uh, a it's a triplet, it's triplet pi, triplet phi, because we don't use, we haven't got linear molecule symmetry in there. So it's whatever that is in D2H. Uh, triplet B2U or something like that. I hear a yes from somewhere else in the audience. So. Uh, I think it's triplet B to you. Okay? We, I mean, we're working through all eight of the symmetries. 
Uh, I just asked Duncan to give me a couple of exemplars. Uh, so it sort of asks the question about whether this is MolPro. You can actually run our code in what I call quantum chemistry mode. That is, we can forget we're doing an R matrix calculation, throw away the R matrix, not take any tails off your integrals, and just diagonalize exactly the same Hamiltonian. And then, at least for the low-lying levels, you should get exactly the same answers. And here you can see the green curves are done with the quantum chemistry mode, and the red curves are done with the bound state. And actually, you'll find that for some curves, we're getting very similar results, and then some curves are actually completely missing because basically they're in the outer region, and you need to define them numerically. We're using an R matrix of 10 for these calculations. So you're getting that from, from the R matrix of 10, and all the way up here, they're basically very diffuse curves that you need, you need to go into this long long outer region. You can, presumably in something like MOLPRO, work very hard at putting lots of diff very diffuse basis functions in there, but Gaussians are not really a natural, Gaussians at one centre are not really a natural way to represent this sort of thing, whereas we get it for free by doing, by doing this two, dividing the space into two states like this. And there's one other step that you want to do if you want to turn this into quantum defects. You want to actually identify the various quantum defect type series. Uh, you get from the results, and I think this is, can you identify which symmetry this is, Steve, from looking at the back there? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it, it, we've just done this, for this is actually the only symmetry we've done it for so far, okay, so this is, uh, da, 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 da. must be pi g. g, thank you, yes, it is pi g, you're right, this is pi g symmetry. So we've gone through and done this already for pi g, and then of course you get a change in the continuum symmetry when you couple to a different, to an excited target state like here. So we're in the process of actually going through and identifying these curves in terms of quantum defects, so you can then use them in, as input to a, to a quantum defect calculation. Now, this is essentially done manually. Uh, our, co our code does spit out when it fits, certainly when it fits the resonances, it spits out the estimate of the quantum defect, but it always assumes you're associated with the next target state up. So it's not always right. You have to actually go through and check that. But once you've got the quantum defects, it actually makes joining the curves very much, very much, more easy, very much easier of course, we now have a diabatic representation of the curve. So you've got this curve here, for instance, wandering right the way through the other curves instead of my previous picture where I had them all with the avoided crossings. So you actually want the avoided crossings for the couplings. <laughs> so I think this is actually opening up a slightly different way to how we've done this in the past, where we've done this in rather crude number of points to map out the curves. Really, certainly I've been collaborating with Neon Schneider on here, and I basically told him he's on his own when he's in this region down here in the past because we haven't had enough information to really characterise what's going on, but I think we're beginning to be able to do that. Okay, so back here again, I want, now I wanted just to do this to actually introduce the idea of doing our matrix of pseudo-states calculations, so now I'm going to actually put an extra set of states in here corresponding to pseudo-states, and I'll have a few words about why we do that and also where they come from. So as I said, we started off doing this really to model impact ionisation, that's what we said on the grant proposal anyway, uh, and more importantly, really, ex to extend the calculations, the range where ionization <coughs> becomes an allowed process uh, so that you can get results over a bigger extent energy range. What was, I knew was going to be a byproduct of this, but actually, in a sense, has turned out to be the most attractive feature of this is that you get a much better representation of the pol polarization. I've also been using it a lot, in fact, most recently, because the results I'm going to show you here are not terribly new, because actually our most recent results are on positron scattering, but this is an electron scattering workshop, so I thought I didn't, wouldn't get into antimatter here. Uh, but this, uh, it's been actually really improved our results qualitatively in terms of doing positron collisions and positron annihilation calculations. So what's the problem? The problem at intermediate impact energies is that if you use a close coupling expansion, you have an infinite number of states up to ionization, so you somehow have to represent an infinity of states, and that's not possible with a sat real set of genuine states. So the idea of the pseudo-states method is to, instead of having the states that go everywhere, you have some finite region, given in our case by the R matrix box, and you simply try and fill up that finite region with states. And because it's a finite region, you get a finite number of states. And then you just have to, so you represent here now a spatial region with a complete set of states opposed to a function region with a complete set of states. So the extra states we've got in here are represented, represented discretized version of the continuum. You obtain them by diagonalizing the Hamiltonian matrix 
for the target exactly as you did with your physical states, but they don't represent physical states of the system. The standard method, and that this is used widely in atomic, in atomic physics, the standard method uh, for getting ionization using this method is simply to assume that all these states that lie above the ionization threshold correspond to ionization, so you just project onto those, and that gives you your ionization cross-section. In principle, you could project those states to give you things like ionization, excitation, and so forth, though I've never actually seen anyone who's done it except in very simple calculations. So we certainly haven't done that yet. Uh, so how do we represent these, these pseudo-states? We have our basic target wave function, which, as I said, is typically a CAS-CI type wave function. We take one electron out and we put it in a pseudo-continuum orbital. Our pseudo-continuum orbitals we generate with these even-tempered Gaussians. So Gaussians where the exponents on the Gaussians are related by a simple series. This has the advantages that you can play around with these parameters, and I'll show you examples of this, to show that you've got completeness and convergence, because if it really works, your results should be uh, insensitive for this. And actually, there are criteria for telling you when they're not insensitive which bits are the right ones and which bits are not the right ones. So you can choose these alpha, naught, and beta to actually allow for systematic generations of basis functions. Now, the problem with this method, or a problem with this method, is we already had two basis functions in our system. We had a set of target basis functions. We had a set of continuum basis functions. So we're already, in principle, overcomplete. So how have we solved this problem? We've added a third set of basis functions to make us even more overcomplete. So my postdoc who worked on this, Jimena Gorfinkel, who was my postdoc at the time, really spent 18 months exploring linear dependence in new and imaginative ways until she finally cracked how to do this, to get these things orthogonal by a seri correct series of orthogonalization processes that give you a decent set of orbitals that don't result in everything crashing down and giving you spurious results. Now, I'm not going to talk about how she did it, but I'm very happy in the next day or so if I was interested to discuss with them how we, how we solved that problem. So just pictorially, what are we doing? And this particular picture actually is uh, for C2 minus, which is the molecule I talk about. So reality in C2 minus is there are three actual bound states of the system, and you get a continuum up here. RMPS reality is you get a reasonable representation of those three, two, but three bound states doing some full CI calculation, and then you get a discretized continuum. In a more complicated system where you have an infinite number of states here, you also get actually that discretized by the RMPS method as well. So you could do, I've not done this, but you could do electronic excitation to these sort of band states here collectively by considering the excitation to the RMPS states if you wanted to. That's an actual picture from a paper done by Mikhail Tarana when he visited me a few years ago, uh, just showing actually when we just did a cat, what I called physical states, that was what we got from our CAS-CI without any RMPS orbitals. This is lithium-2. When we do the RMPS, you get this sort of picture here showing that we top up the missing states just below dissociation. There is a gap here at the ionization threshold. That means you're going to get no ionization basically for one EV here in this particular system, which is actually seems to be reasonably physically correct. The ionization threshold is very low onset here. And this is showing that actually, as you vary the basis, you get a rather similar sort of structure in, in, in the states involved. So the original calculation we did was H3+. Plus. There were two reasons for doing this, one of which is that uh, actually, as pointed out by Brendan McLaughlin, we were going to have less uh, linear dependence problems if we did an ion, because ions generally are better behaved because they draw all the charge in. And secondly, Anne had done a cone calculation, which we then repeated with an R matrix calculation and got the same answers. So we thought we knew what the right answer was. So that was our first mistake. Uh, so we did a calculation where we did a standard target times continuum function going up to G waves, and then we augmented that with some pseudo-continuum orbitals where we just did SPD waves for the pseudo-continuum orbitals. And we tested lots of different basis sets. I think actually we tested a lot more than these basis sets because we certainly also varied beta as well. Uh, and then you look at the ionization, and uh, the first thing you get is a huge number of pseudo-resonances above ionization. That's fairly well known. The atomic people live with this sort of thing all the time, and they simply uh, convolute them. We convoluted them by putting Gaussians through them, and you get this black curve, which is slightly wiggly. Uh, you can see that we certainly agree at low energy with what a Vanier law type prediction would give. We have one basis set which is quite clearly not converged. It doesn't give results to agree with the other basis sets. 
but you get something which looks reasonably reasonable here. Now, at the point when we did this calculation, there was no measurement of the same process. Since then, the other UCL, uh, Pierre de France's group in, in levin Leneuve, have actually done a measurement of this, and they get a completely different answer. Now, I don't think that means either of us are wrong. I think we're just not measuring the same thing, because the problem is they've done it on D3+, plus using a very hot source, and their D3+, plus is very hot. And we're doing this on ground state H3+. Plus. So I don't think, well, we haven't got any nuclear moments, so it may be notions, so maybe ground state D3+. Plus. But I don't think they're measuring the same thing from the ground state. They're looking at highly excited vibrational states. Then we started looking at electronic excitation. And here the resonance structure is, at least in principle, physical. You should get resonances of electronic excitation. And what we found was, compared to our original six-state model, that was the same model that we'd used and Anne had used, the resonances all moved down in energy. For quite a while we thought we had a bug in the code, and then we realised actually this was right, and it was right for a rather simple reason. If you compute the polarizability given of the target using the six-state model, you get a reasonable-ish number for the parallel polar polarizability, but you get practically no perpendicular polarizability. It so happens that none of those six states contribute to that polarizability. When you look when you add in these uh, pseudo-states, as you add them in, you converge to what is, should be an accurate, accurate value for the polarizability. So you're recovering the polarizability correctly in the calculation by putting in these pseudo-states. And just to remind you, that's, uh, that's what we're talking about here, that if you use a sum over states formalism formula for polarizabilities, it looks like this. And you have to, for most systems, basically include the continuum. Otherwise, you don't get a good representation for this. And that's what the pseudo-states, of course, is doing is giving you the continuum in the region of your target wave function, so that this sum actually converges to something reasonable. And I had an MSc student actually do this on a number of molecules, where he compared, this is just an example for water, but he did three or four molecules that are in this paper, compared computing polarizabilities just using a standard sort of method we use compared with the, the RMPS results, and I had to restrain him from stopping his calculations here and saying that he got a perfect answer. But actually, we should. We, we don't have a terribly good target here. And you're aware that if the target is not great, it's too polarizable because the wave function is not contracted in and hard enough as it is when you really put in all the CI and get a fully converged target. So this is probably converging to the right result for the target, which is a little bit bigger than the actual real polarizability of the system. Uh, so I think this method works, you can see we're converging at not a ridiculous number of states, 50 or 60 states, which is certainly a doable number of states in our calculations, particularly if in the outer region we throw out the high states, we don't bother actually keep them when we come to doing the R matrix in the outer region. So just to give you one example of a calculation using this method, uh, electron collisions with C2 minus. So the, these are reasonably old experiments done in the asteroid storage ring. Uh, Rich can tell us when that closed down, but it was quite a long time ago now. Uh, and they found all these resonances actually in a number of diatomic ions. They found resonances. We happened to focus on C2 minus because it seemed to appeal to us the most. When they did photo detachment measurements, or, or sorry, electron impact detachment measurements here, they saw a number of ions. So we did a series of calculations. We start off doing electron collisions off. C2. C2 actually is a god-awful target to do electron collisions off because I think we had 26 physical states in the system to get this right. But we actually showed, for instance, there were exactly three bound states to the system. There was something that had grown up in the literature, so there were four, but the quartet is a resonance, not a bound state. And the only experimental measurement was in a, 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 an argon matrix, and it's certainly not going to be right. So to do electron collisions off C2 minus, we needed three things. We needed electron collisions from an anion, something we'd never done with the code before. We needed the RMPS method I've just told you about. And actually, we needed a method which didn't require us to take all the solutions from diagnosing our now very big Hamiltonian, because actually that was going to be too expensive. Our Hamiltonians were getting it much over 100,000 by 100,000. At that point, actually, we can now diagnose full 100,000 by 100,000 Hamiltonians, but we couldn't at that point. So I, I wrote a, a new partition R matrix method, which allows us to take three or 4,000 solutions for these Hamiltonians, use iterative diagnosis, and do a little bit of error correcting for the met methods we'd left out. So this just shows that, actually, much to our amazement, our code gives the right answer, which is nothing very much. If you do scattering, you just have a pure negative iron. 
So actually, some, who had ever coded the Coulomb functions and everything, had got it all right for all the signs, so that was good news for us. What was less good news was actually trying to develop a completely consistent scattering model for this. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but that's our basic target. Then you put the pseudo states in, then you put the pseudo states in, you have to worry how you're going to get all these L squared functions. And this is basically our recipe. And if you do the target CI that you want to do, you simply end up with too many pseudo states. In fact, the code, the configuration generator simply fell over at this. There were too many of them to generate. Uh, so we, I don't even know how big the problem it was that we couldn't solve because we certainly could, we couldn't even quantify it. So we had to then start taking some compromises on how we did this aspect of the calculation to do this aspect. And what we learned was something I think most of you already know, that basically you have to balance them or you don't get a good answer. So you had to work very hard to make sure that we use the same level of calculation in both. So this actually uh, just gives a, it's, it's a small calculation, but just shows the full calculation by, against the partition R matrix calculation, showing that instead of taking 6,500 uh, solutions, we can take 650 and still get the same answers. So that's at least as encouraging that that bit of the problem solves. And this is now routinely in use in our, in our group in the for doing calculations. So you start doing these calculations with different basis sets, and what you get is this rather spiky structure due to pseudo-resonances. There's some broader structures, and what we're looking for here is a resonance in this system, or maybe more than one resonance in this system. And you actually say, well, how do you find a resonance in all this lot? Because you've got lots of them there, you can choose anything you want. Well, the answer is that you have to repeat it with different basis sets and hope that they end up all giving one resonance in the same place, and the other stuff, which is just grass, moves around as you change the basis sets. So you can see here that we have them all lining up with one resonant feature here, but the other features don't, don't correlate. So at the end of that, we, dis we had a very low-lying resonance, actually, was in the first picture I showed you, which is also predicted by Sommerfeld from doing L-squared type calculations with stabilization. That's not observed experimentally. There's essentially no flux in the experiment at this region. And then we find two other resonances of pi g symmetry, singlet and triplet. We found no evidence for a singlet sigma g minus resonance, which is what was predicted in the experimental paper on the basis of some Gaussian type calculations to be the cause of the resonance structure. So if you compare our calculation thus far, we can see that we have a resonance here, which we say we're claiming we're uh, assigning that resonant feature here. But the more observant of you may notice that our cross-sections don't seem to agree terribly well with the experimental cross-sections, so we're clearly missing something in this calculation. Now, what we're doing here is electron scattering off an iron, so we're doing Coulomb scattering. We all know that Coulomb scattering doesn't converge well with partial waves. All we've done at the moment is up to L equals 4 G waves, so we need to do something about the higher partial waves. So we simply did a Coulomb-Born approximation for that. So we have the resonance mechanism here. We have an unusual form of the shape resonance here. What we, seem to, what we seem to be getting here is something, you've got something completely repulsive, and then you put enough polarization in, you actually trap the electron in a, in, a, in a slightly unusual shape resonance. We even get it in an S wave. So this is not the sort of shape resonance that you normally learn about. So the basic potential is strongly repulsive. We have a local minimum due to the polarization effect, and this gives these shape resonances. Our other two resonances are a little bit too high, which suggests that we still haven't fully captured all the polarization effects. And we did have to, th you know, we cut down our model slightly to make it computationally tractable. So, cross-sections. What have we got wrong here? So far, we've only got L greater than, less than 5, as the back to give the back, which does not give the background cross-section, because Coulomb potentials basically go to very high L. So what we did was a dipole-born approximation to represent all the high L cross-sections. And with that, for that, we did calculations using the pseudo-states but just for the symmetries that are allowed in dipole allowed, and we just summed up all the cross-sections to the pseudo-states for that, those symmetries, and that gave us those cross-sections, which I, I have to say were uncannily good. I didn't ex quite expect them to turn out quite that well. You can see our resonance here is just slightly higher than the resonance here. And don't get put off by the large seeming experimental signal here. This is the threshold. There should be no signal in this region. This is just experimental noise. These are difficult experiments. They have quite large error bars. Mm. OK, so I think uh, I'm getting, getting to the end of what, what I want to tell you about. Uh, so I like the RMPS method. It extends the range of the calculations. It allows us to treat 
the ionization region, in particular to improve the representation of polarization. I think we can do this. Sorry, I, that seems to have been a stray comment uh, from a previous talk. Sorry about that. Uh, it allows us to treat uh, high electronic states in, in, in the process. And as I say, in particular, I think it's a solution to really getting a systematic representation of the polarization effects. So I should just add, thank by, finish by thanking the members of my group who've done the calculations. So this is also moved around. That's anyway. So Duncan, who was working on the uh, uh, electron N2 plus, Vincenzo, who was doing the electron CO, and I should also mention Steve Harrison, who uh, is actually in the process of putting photons into our codes with a view to doing high intensity laser work. Now I've not talked about that. We haven't as yet got any results, but Alex is going to talk about using the R matrix code for these, these sort of problems. And we're certainly employing some of the developments Alex, Alex, is, Alex is doing. Now, this is my group, which has hit an all-time high in size. And that's partly because this is not really my day job anymore. Uh, I, got, I got significant funding from the European Research Council to work on something completely different. And if you're interested to know about what, you can go and have a look there. And there's a nice podcast of how, how we're going to observe exoplanets using quantum mechanical calculations performed by my group. Thank you very much. Steve. Yeah. Does your, am I correct in saying your, your code incorporates the sweep of the code? Is that what yes. The, the integral generator we have at the moment is, is Sweden Molecule from Jan Amos. Wow. Is there any chance on going to using the CI instead of CAS SCF wave functions? Uh, the, we don't have the Sweden configuration generator. The, the, so the, the only bit from the Sweden code is the integral generation. Oh, okay. okay? Uh, the, the actual configuration generator we use is really aged. It goes back to Alchemy 1, as rewritten extensively by me and by Cliff Noble and, and various other people. Uh, the, so ask me your question again. What, 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 did you, what wave functions did you want to use? Right, so we, take, we import CAS SCF orbitals. We tend to do it from MOLPRO because that's the, the code of choice in, our, in my group. But in principle, you can, you can take them from anywhere. Uh, we had, a, we had a, a collaboration meeting on Friday last week, and there was a discussion of actually going over to a Molden interface whereby you just take your orbitals from whatever your favorite quantum chemistry code was and feed, feed them in that way. Uh, we've played with both using natural orbitals and CAS SCF orbitals. I think the N2 plus stuff we've done we're all done with CAS SCF orbitals from, from MOLPRO. Uh, from the CO calculations, yep. did you do it local or non local? It's, it's, it's local, so it's, 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 it's not the most sophisticated calculation in the world. Uh, but our, our paymasters here are very much more interested in quantity than quality. You can see, I, mean, I, got, I got, got my ear severely bent for the first year at our collaboration meeting for turning up, telling them how marvellous we were developing the theory and getting it really accurate. And I was told very firmly that was not what they wanted. They wanted data to fill in their database. And, and not, and <laughs> so, you know, we went for the cheap and dirty. We went for the cheap and dirty solution. So it seems yep. like there are various directions one might consider going to really take the next sort of step with this code. One could yep. go to non-orthogonal orbitals, or yep. one could go to equation of motion, sort of uh, you know, couple of cluster ideas. I, what do you think is the most important uh, to, to really be able to, in a balanced way, without by hand adjustments, uh, really right. get okay. the encouraged results? The, the absolute most immediate thing, which I sort of alluded to briefly, but I didn't do, is to get rid of our Gaussian basis set or somehow extend on our Gaussian basis sets for continuum functions. Because they're a real handicap, both in the size of molecule we can treat, the size of the R matrix, which can be even just Rydberg states of very small molecules become, become a big problem, and the energy range. I mean, the two, two, two processes are coupled. So that's a, that doesn't really directly answer your question, but that's the most immediate Thing. And we're just, that was actually also what we were discussing on Friday on how, how to get around on that. I think that the RMPS method has a, has a lot of promise to it. I, don't, I actually don't know how you balance beyond the sort of CAS-CI model 
that we're doing. And maybe, you know, I've played around, for instance, with uh, second quantization methods. So you, you, you take some notional target wave function and you have a, an, a creation operator on it. And that, you can write it all down very elegantly, but I don't, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't give anything that actually can turn into, into code or even into detailed integral equations that, that works. Uh, so it's still something I, I'm toying with, and I don't know whether, you know, maybe you have maybe you have some ideas, and it's something we can talk about offline. But I don't see immediately how you improve your target wave functions to that. But I think the RMPS method conversely has a lot of a lot of promise, and we're looking very seriously at doing big parallel implementations because the advantage of actually going to iterative diagonalization with the partitioned R matrix is that actually that becomes much more easy to put on parallel parallel processes rather than trying to do the full diagonalization. Which is really a shared memory, shared memory problem. I'm, I mean, the big leap in yeah. atomic R yeah. came from non-orthogonal Yes. That, that well, and we may well. I think we may well go that way. I think we need to do the the continuum basis sets first, and I think it is possible that then we. But but for quantum chemistry, no one uses orthogonal non-orthogonal orbitals. Uh, you do you know any 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 electron straight electronic structure? Yes. yes. You do. Uh, okay. Um, so it depends. We use them for. Yeah. Right. Okay. So looking at those yeah, I mean, I can imagine that that would be, you know, that would be where we go to after solving the continuum basis set problem, because uh, it, it it does, you know, you when you see some of the stuff which uh, Satsurini and Barchat have done on atoms, it's really impressive. You just think, I'd love to be able to do that for molecules, and it, their stuff absolutely relies on using non-orthogonal orbitals. And I don't, I think technically that's, I mean, I think. It, People are, it's technically possible to implement. You have to generalize the codes, but I think it's, it's not a showstopper. Yeah. I'm going to go back to this R, uh, RMPS. Um, <clears throat> Yes. So you do not allow flux when you do the matching. If you have three no. physical channels, so you you choose the you, you, you choose the RMPS you choose the RMPS orbitals to fit inside your box. All right. Well, then if, you, if, yeah. you're, if, if you're trying if if you want such states to represent a discretized continuum, how can you possibly expect them to fit inside the box? Well, you probably have a hierarchy of boxes here, if you if you if you like. So you have a target you have a target region where your target wave function is particularly the ground state of the target wave function, that is probably quite a lot smaller than your, right. than your box. Right. It is a reason why we probably need, it's one of many reasons why we probably need bigger boxes right. than we're already using. You're right, the, I mean, I actually, when we started looking, the intermediate R matrix method is very appealing. It's much more rigorous than the RMPS method. Oh. The RMPS is slight, has, has slightly dirty aspects right. to it, uh, some of which are showed by how you, know, how you have to fiddle around with the different basis functions. Right. Uh, but actually, to do it for more than two electron systems, even with the atomic people, is really hard work. And they've struggled for uh, more than a decade trying to go beyond really doing electron-hydrogen collisions with yes, it. Right. Uh, so, you know, we, I looked, I actually spent a, I spent a couple of days writing out all, we, the Hamiltonian thing, which I wrote here, has seven special cases for Hamiltonian matrix elements, which it constructs. And I spent an afternoon, or must be much more than an afternoon, writing out all the special cases that you would get from an intermediate R matrix on the same logic. And when I got to 54, <laughs> I thought, this code is never going to work, because actually you had so many cases to debug right. that I thought the chances of actually getting it right was so small that it, this was not <laughs> an enterprise to be, to be embarked upon. So that was then when we started looking at our MPS which essentially needed no coding. I mean, the RMPS, the only thing we've done to it is, is uh, systematize our orthogonalization procedures. Uh, so it essentially needed no coding compared to what was right. already, already there. Well, we, I think we do something that's uh, uh, intellectually similar yeah. to RMPS, because uh, we also use uh, complete active spaces to define the target orbitals that you yeah. choose. Now, the total number of configurations in, in a KSSCF can be rather large, mm -hmm. right? I have a small system, say, five or 10,000 configurations. Yep. You're taking a very small linear combination of those to make the physical 
target states join the group with close coupling. Yep. In principle, you have the complement of that space. So mm -hmm. if you have 5,000 configurations in five states, you have 5,000 minus five more states you can make out of the same set. And we routinely include all of them. I, I, no, I don't think that's the same. If I go back up to my water picture, I missed it. Yeah. I think that's that. What is that? What do you mean by state? That's doing what you're doing, I think. That's using all the all the states available in your CAS CI to generate all possible states, but no spe right. but no special basis set. And uh, well, I guess And that that's when you put a special basis set in. So I don't know whether you've tried this, you can try it, it's fairly easy to do. You can actually work out what your polarizability given by putting all those states in. I think you'll converge to too, to too low a value. Uh, the, well, okay, there's another thing. The, yeah. I mean, the, prob the, prob the reason standard yeah. doesn't necessarily always work is because if you have to go outside, the, you know, if you're working in a particular symmetry, then, of course, the complement of these well, you only measured states of the same symmetry. You have to also include all the other states of other symmetries other than the one you're explicitly working on. Sure, but you can do that implicitly by yeah, in, we, in your I model. Mean, I've just done this. I'm doing huge calculations on water, and I get polarizability smack on. Well, you must have very diffuse basis. Yes. Okay. We, this, is, this is a fairly small basis. Of course, oh, okay. if you put enough diffuse functions in, you have something which begins to look R, like, a bit like the RMPS. You see what I mean? Right. The RMPS is a systematic way of putting in the diffuse functions. 